Another episode of the Health Detective Podcast by Functional Diagnostic Nutrition. We are on episode number 285 today. If you're watching live, welcome. If you're watching the recording, welcome. And then if you're listening on audio, just know that this was done a couple of weeks ago and you could have caught it uh, live if you were subscribed to us on YouTube. So make sure you check the link in the description and you can get to see our uh, guests' beautiful faces. My you know, mid-tier face, maybe 5 out of 10 on a normal day, 7 out of 10 if I kind of comb the beard and stuff. Um, so we'd love to see you guys more on there. Make sure to uh, subscribe to YouTube and catch the live ones. Now, with that said, we have a repeat guest today, but anyone that is listening would not know that because Samantha, aka Sam, was one of our first guests on the show all the way back at episode 19. So we're going since we recorded. I'm going to read her very interesting bio here, and then we are going to get into this. And I, I promise you this can be a good one today. So Samantha Lander, or Sam for short, had quite the journey and continues to create more chapters in that journey. She is a St. Louis, Missouri-based single mom, recovering addict, prison survivor, personal trainer, functional diagnostic nutrition practitioner, DJ, and entrepreneur. She published Dream Big, Do Bigger, and is an international best-selling author. Sam used FDN to heal herself from allergies, food sensitivities, heavy metals, mold, hormonal imbalances, specifically PCOS, mouth trauma and infections, and also several parasites. She got sick and tired of being sick and tired. I love that. All the doctors said she was fine, but she followed her gut, which is the common theme for 95% of the people that come on here. You know, her full, uh, full bio is going to be... um in the show notes, but we'll end up talking about a lot of this other stuff anyway. So Sam, welcome to the podcast once again. How are you? Thanks. Hi, Evan. I'm good. Cool. So we just got to um, see each other in person for uh, probably the second or third time. And we got to see each other at the Wise Traditions Conference in uh, Kansas City, Missouri. So that was awesome. But I want to, again, fully reintroduce you here in terms of some of the things that you've been through. I remember listening to the podcast and I was actually very happy uh, when I got to meet you, not just because you're a lovely person, but because you were the only FDN I've met with a criminal record worse than mine. Um, and so I was just, it made me feel good. Maybe no, we're not alone here, baby. You can turn your life around, get into FDN and uh, do the good work. So um, Sam, I'd love to hear about your background. When did the first health symptoms start for you? And, and what did they look like at the time? So when I look back, I would say they started where I, like, I really knew it was fifth grade. And I started getting chronic, like, GI issues, just horrible. Like, I just remember a lot of, I just remember being like, Mom, my stomach hurts, I can't go to school. And I, I know that, that a lot of it was stress-related, but I'm sure that at that point there was some sort of underlying infection. And then just, you know, the Band-Aids of uh, lots of um, medication to help with stomach IBS, you know, the umbrella term. And then I feel as though the chronic fatigue started when I was in middle school, coupled with like constipation, diarrhea. And I remember just like always being like really, really, really tired, like just crazy tired. And that's sort of when it started, I would say around then, like that fifth grade to like middle school. And then, of course, at that age, I'm guessing you were very much like myself and, and several other people on the show who had dealt with symptoms really early on. It's not like... I'm sure you're not thinking about the holistic side of this, right? You're just thinking this sucks. What's going on with my body? No, no, I, I did not know. I know they put me on, uh, it wasn't Klonopin. It was like clonazepam or no. Um, I don't know why I'm getting a blank, but it sounds like that. But I remember looking it up and the, um, the alternative name for it was Belladonna. It was like Belladonna West Ward. I remember looking it up and it, there was some sort of like herb or some, something in it that way back in the day, they would put this under people's pillow who would have like very vivid dreams and GI issues. It was like, so I remember being like, well, that's kind of interesting. So then I felt like a little more comfortable taking it, but um, it was supposed to, I think, relax the small muscle tissue in your gut to help ease with like that stress that when your stomach locks up. Okay, geez. So yeah, again, you're not thinking holistically, you're more just like, okay, what the heck's going on? Um, how did these symptoms progress and, and what other things got stacked on as you got older, maybe into the high school years or even um, or, or like early adulthood? Like what was starting to happen then? Okay. I feel like I'm piecing this together more and more like as I go through my health journey, which is funny. So I actually had a deviated septum very, 
you know, where you're, I had a lot of sinus infections. So I had a deviated septum. I was a thumb sucker. So I feel as though this whole area here has had like my palate between, cause I, we were just talking about my mouth stuff, but so my palate was very wide. So I have a wide mouth. I had a deviated septum. So a lot of my sinus drainage due to allergies and GI issues, sort of like, I feel like it all kind of started here in my sinuses, but I also, um, you know, noticed that along with like the GI stuff and the sinus stuff, I was also like an elite athlete. I was doing a lot of cardio. There's a lot of stress being done on the body. And, um, you know, I, I started getting put on a ton of antibiotics. And then from there, it was just done. So I think that that was kind of the next rodeo. Were you dealing with side effects from the antibiotics at the time or was it something that, because I know for some people there's no immediate symptoms or obvious ones and they think, oh, this is great. I just take these pills super easy and all of a sudden the stuff that I'm dealing with goes away at least temporarily or were they things that started to affect you? Because I, I mean, for myself, they definitely got me. Yeah. Looking back, I'm sure I remember I, I would crave carbs and sugar like no other, like no other. Like I would go into the basement and eat like a frozen cheesecake if I could. We didn't have a lot of sugar in our house. So I was one of those that went to college and it was like, game on. But so my, I, we ate pretty clean overall. So you would think that like I would have been a very healthy kid. But I just I think it just wrecked havoc on my on my uh, gut. And then. Yeah, from there, I think that was the catalyst. People don't realize this. I think sometimes even in once they first start getting into the natural medicine thing, they're like, OK, I'd avoid antibiotics if I can. But, hey, if I got to take them, I got to take them. And th there is a time and place for that. What I'm about to say is not medical advice at all. I just think people don't know how to weigh the decision properly. I mean, these are really things that should be used in cases where there's huge risk of infection or active infection. Like, yeah, don't be a hero. You don't want to die because you didn't take an antibiotic. That's very silly. Uh Yes, bacteria have killed human beings through as long as we've been alive. This is well documented. That's not a secret. But at the same time, it needs to be something that is uh, not taken lightly. It's not just something that you do with, you know, a cold. That, my God, I remember when I was a kid, they were worried about colds turning into something more. Yeah, do this as precautionary. No, no, no. That's not what we do with antibiotics. Um, teeth infections, whatever it might be, severe sinus infections. They can go to the brain. There's other things that can happen there. Okay, totally makes sense, but we got to try some other stuff. So at what point, obviously, if people were listening to the beginning, especially when I read your bio, at some point they realized there must have been a massive shift in one direction and then a massive shift in the other. So what the heck happened next? How, if you don't mind sharing this today, how the heck did you get in trouble? But then all the heck, also, how the heck did you get into functional medicine afterwards? I know, right? Um, so I, you know, I sort of progressed. Um, I, I did well. I was always kind of like a... I live life on the edge. I was very experimental with drugs and all alcohol and all that good stuff when I was younger. And then it sort of like dissipated uh, at the end of high school. And then I went to college. I did the normal drinking thing. Um, but I was always a blackout drinker. You know, it was always, it was never normal. Like my drinking habits were never normal, but I, I guess I thought they were because that's what I saw other people in college doing it. Um, but I, I I, I just remember there's a few people looking back that I was like, mm, that, it looks like they have a problem, but like, I, I don't, I didn't remember anything. And I just thought that was normal. And, um, you know, I, I ended up quitting, um, until I went out, I went through a, a sort of a stressful breakup and I went out to California and that's when I was introduced to a whole nother slew of, of drugs. And that was my perfect cocktail. So, you know, it relieved me of every health problem that I felt like I've been struggling with. And it helped me with, undi uh, I mean, it was diagnosed, but ADHD, I was using a lot of meth um, and then a lot of club drugs. I was, a, I became, a, I decided to become a DJ. And so I just went from like this athlete, my whole life, very, you know, into sports, kept me very grounded, stopped that. And then it just like went the other way. I don't, you know, a lot of self-medicating. Um, when I was using meth, my ADHD was like, I felt like I was normal for the first time. So I was able to do really well in school. I felt like I was like able to process thoughts differently. 
I, I did feel like my anxiety around like the stomach aches and the chronic fatigue obviously was better. So all those things that I felt like I was struggling with, they were gone. So I felt like it was okay. You know, I mean, it's the same thing. I mean, Adderall is pretty much the same thing as meth, if you ask me. And, you know, I got in, I got into drugs and then I'm an entrepreneur. So you throw that on top of it and I decided to make a business out of it. You know, I eventually moved out to California, became a DJ and sold drugs. And that's the, that's the story. <laughs> that's yeah. yeah. And then these stories, it's so funny when you hear it from the outside, it's like, you can see how it's going to go from the first step in the wrong direction. Right. But when we're dealing with it, we can't see it at the time. This seems like a great plan. Like, wait, I can do this stuff and make money. This is brilliant. The best idea ever in the moment. Um, but then, you know, all good things must come to an end. And jokes aside, one thing I really wanted to emphasize is even within your story, as intense as some of the drug use is and all these things, you brought this up. You felt normal at one point. You were solving some of the stuff that you dealt with. So drugs in themselves, at least initially for many people that abuse them, it wasn't the problem for us. It was a piss poor solution to the other problems that we hadn't figured out how to deal with yet. And again, the drugs are the devil, right? Even just metaphorically, you don't have to be spiritual or religious. They are metaphorically the devil because they give you what you want initially, but then they create hell long term because now you're, you're trading problems basically. So yeah, I'll solve your stuff just long enough for you to need me. And then the second that you need me, that's when you realize, oh wait, this was one of the worst decisions I could ever make. Right? So it works for a little bit until it, it probably doesn't work as well eventually. And then it's leading you to a bunch of trouble. So, um, Obviously, yeah, you got arrested. Uh, you went to yeah. prison, and and all this stuff happens. But how do you how do you get out of that? Because Sam, the statistics they really aren't good uh, for people who go through this stuff. And yet, you're blessed enough to be here after making the right decisions and and having some insight in hopefully a positive direction that led you to this. So, how did things get on the right track? I think just as my um, drive to you know, use drugs. My drive not to use drugs is, is very strong. I'm very stubborn. I'm very hard headed. I am very determined. I, when I see something, I'm going to go and I'm going to get it. So for me, I think that, you know, I was, I had to learn that everybody's rock bottom is going to be very, very different. And when I hit my rock bottom, I was, I was okay. I had an apartment. I had a, you know, I was okay. Like life was still like, okay. I wasn't living on skid row. And, but I was, I was spiritually like bankrupt. Like I, I had nothing left in me and I knew I used to pray on it. I'd be like, I'm, when I'm sick and tired of being sick and tired, I will solve the solution. And I, I got sick and tired of being sick and tired. And I was looking at, you know, jail time and all that good stuff. And I decided, and, and that's the thing is like, that never stopped me. Like, I, I mean, I, I cut back, you know, and I stopped selling drugs two weeks before I got in trouble, which is interesting. But I never, like, I just wasn't, I didn't have the ability to just be done, like, even though I had consequences being thrown in my face. And that's when I believe that, like, my higher power was trying really, really hard to wake me the F up. It's like, I always say, you know, for me, my higher power, God, or whatever I believe in, likes to take a bat to my head several times. And that's usually what it takes to get me to, like, snap out of it. And... You know, I went to rehab and I, it's like the pink cloud was there. I was, I've never been so happy in my life. I went to, I went to prison happy. I mean, I wasn't ecstatic, but I was okay with it because I was sober. And, um, you know, and, and my life was good. I was working out again. I was getting back on like, you know, I'd always been an athlete. I'd always been healthy. I'd always worked out. I didn't think I had the ability to even work out ever again because of all the drug use I did. And I went to a rehab where I got to do that and it was really healthy eating. And it just like, I felt as though I was getting back to my moral compass that I sort of grew up with that my parents had taught me to like really eat clean and, and um, you don't need, you don't need all the, the drugs. <laughs> That's amazing. Um, I'm so glad that everything worked out with this and I'm glad that you feel that there was this guidance um, as all this was happening. I also, I found it really interesting when you said, yes, no one's ecstatic uh, to go to jail, but there's this, when I got in trouble and I got arrested, I was living this very paranoid life 
for the last couple of years. And that's what people don't get. If you're doing this stuff, it's not like you feel great all the time, right? You're constantly paranoid. You're constantly worried, especially when you add in selling to it. Give me a break. I mean, you're always no. looking over your shoulder, uh, both for legal consequences, but for per personal consequences. People want to take money from you. And um, I will never forget, this isn't, it's not something I shared on the show before. I mean, I wrote about it, but I didn't share it in the show. When I first got in trouble, before you go to any facility, right? You go to a holding thing at the local thing or whatever, local station. And there was bright lights in this room. There's a bench that's hard as hell, right? And it's like maybe a foot wide. The and I, I slept on that thing for probably five hours before they actually woke up and got me help. And then anyone asking this would say, well, you must have been on something, right? I actually wasn't in the moment. I slept because there was this odd, as bad as it was, there was this odd relief that came from, oh, it's over, man. It's done. Good. Yep, it's it's over. <laughs> There's no more hiding. There's no more whatever. It's like, um, it, well, it, it literally is this. You've been living this lie. You've had to lie to people to get th through with this. I don't need to lie anymore. It, it's now there's consequences to that too, but it's over and I can stop playing this double uh, agent where this is my life here and this is my life there, especially uh, with the good upbringing. It sounds like you had, I had the same thing. So you know that this isn't you, you know, this isn't where you belong. I mean, you got to figure these things out. So how do you find FDN afterwards and all these other certifications? Cause you are a well-credentialed person. I mean, you got a lot of different stuff. So when did you like pursue it to that level? So, I, so I, you know, I went to prison for 27 months and I did everything I could to eat clean and I worked out and all the things and I got really healthy before I went in. I was teaching spinning. I mean, I did, I overtrained like, so in my mind, healthy, right. is working out a lot and a lot. Like I did a lot of working out in prison too, <laughs> <laughs> you know, and then calorie counting, I was calorie counting, working out. Nothing was changing. I was like gaining weight. But then I got out, I became a personal trainer and, you know, I was doing all the right things, eating right, counting calories and eating super, super, super clean. But I had chronic diarrhea. So I was gaining weight. I started getting my period every other week. Um, when I was in prison, I got cystic acne, um, which is, yeah. And then, um, which I've never had in my life. And, you know, I, I was in the health and wellness industry and someone introduced me to someone and said, Hey, why don't you run a, like a food sensitivity test with this guy? And he might've like started the FDN course, but it was in person. He had started it like in person. He was like, he was before me and he ran the test with me. And it was like, there were so many things on it. It was insane. And within that first week, it was like, Holy, sh sh sorry. Holy crap. You're good. You're doing great, actually. I know, right? You, you know me, so I'm doing really well. So it, it was like, it was like, oh my God, cinder block number one was lifted. It's not me. It's not that I'm doing something wrong with my workouts or my eating. There's something like internally, root cause, like something's not right. And so it started with the food sensitivity test. And then, and I was broke and he was like, I was just like, I didn't, you know, I didn't care where my money went. I just wanted to like feel better. And then the next thing that came was the biohealth spit test. And then he eventually got me to do a stool test and I was better. I did. So I was doing all the lab testing that kind of like what we initially do. And I was feeling like within a month I, I was like, oh my, God. I felt like I had my life back, like three fourths of my life back. And I was like, oh my gosh, there's so much more to all of this than just working out and eating clean. Like there's so much more. And now I know there's even more and that like passion and going through it. I just knew that that was something I needed to add into my world to help my clients because I trained a ton of women going through the same thing. And I went through it. They saw me go through it. So like, it was easy to convince them that there's something else to it. And the other little secret is I got sick of paying for all the labs. <laughs> I mean, it gets really expensive. So it sort of started with me not wanting to pay full price for all the labs. So I was like, well, I'm going to take a course then I'm certified and I can run them on myself. It'll be half the cost. And that was another reason why. And so that's how I got my foot in the door doing this. The, the similarities, because I remember, I actually do remember this from back at episode 19, because the way that we think is kind of hilarious, because, because you're right, it's that same stubbornness that got you 
into maybe this bad stuff that also got you out of it. But then I love your thought process with the labs because the whole reason, and they're stuck with me now, the whole reason I got into FDN is because I was trying to heal the health stuff. I realized I was 21 at the time. I'm like, damn, this is like $4,000 to go work with someone. I'm going to call mom and dad up and convince them this is college and maybe get them to pay for the course so that I don't have to go work with someone. And and sure enough, uh, God bless them, that did work. They're like, we've always wanted you to go to college, so this can be... Uh, your version of it. It was the first. We, we, yeah, we make it a money making thing. Yep, yep. It was the first academic thing that I was ever excited about for the most part. So they were just, they were happy to have that. Now, obviously, you've made huge strides with your health. Uh, there's always little things that we're working on. I, I love what you said, right? There's still a journey being written here. It's still a story being told in a sense. One of the things that we wanted to focus on today, though, too, because technically, if people want to hear the story again, you're, you're more than welcome to go back to that original episode. But we wanted to talk about the impact of alcohol on your body. And I think you're a great person to talk about this. You've been through this yourself and you so, came out on the other side, which I'm not being discouraging. It's just something that we don't see nearly enough. So um, where can we even begin with this topic? Because I think people know oh, it's bad. You shouldn't do it every day and all the time. But um, let's dive a little deeper. Like what's really going on when people are doing this to the point of blacking out or whatever it might be? Well, so let me have a little disclaimer right here. Is sure. I was sober for 13 years. And then after my son, I started drinking and I, I haven't done any of the drugs and all that stuff because I didn't really drink them, but I did relapse. And throughout my relapse, I learned like very quickly the impact of alcohol on the body. Um, firsthand. So that's, I'm grateful for the relapse, you know, in some ways, because I, I learned like, I mean, I was ready because it's a disease. Addiction's a disease, right? You'll do anything to, your brain will tell you anything you need to hear to keep you doing it. But I mean, that, my anxiety was so bad. It was to the point where I was like, fuck it, I, I might medicate myself. Like, and that's not what FDNers do. Like that's, it's just not, we, we usually find other ways to do it through like hormones, but like everything, like all, everything went crazy. And then I was like, Oh, okay. And that's when I really started taking a deep dive into like the impact of alcohol, because it is, I mean, it's a cult cultural thing with moms and women. I mean, there's a lot that we can go down. So yeah, let's talk about it. Well, and I mean, even I guess before that, because it does matter to this story, if I may ask this, what you associated this with the birth of um, your child, but was it the stress of that? Or like you, you mentioned these cultural things of being a mom, like at 13 years, a hell of a long time, man, that's impressive. So what, what happened? Um, so, you know, I was in a relationship with someone or my husband and, you know, he had 23 years in, in sobriety and, wow. you know, he may not be, I don't know, you know, I, whatever he's on his path. And, you know, he was, it, it's nothing against him. He drinks more normal than I do, but he started drinking when I was pregnant. And in my mind, that's when my disease started again. Mm -hmm. And it was like, oh, I can't wait to do this when I'm, when I'm after my kid is born. And then I had postpartum and then I wasn't working. And then a lot of other little things throughout our relationship. Just So it just was, I was just completely overwhelmed and I stopped working my program of recovery. Okay. And, and that's when I um, started drinking, you know, I hear, you know, I trained women and they'd be like, oh, the wine, it, all they're like, it sounded so great when they would talk about the wine and this and that. And, you know, my health was better. I think part of what kept me sober is I was so sick. Like my stomach, like I didn't want to add anything else into my body that could possibly keep me from actually feeling better. Cause I was so sick for so long. Yeah. It's a great point that that was the, uh, that maybe the blessing of being sick is because alcohol is by far the most normalized drug. And it's a hell of a drug at that. I, I couldn't, that was never a major part of my story uh, when I was abusing drugs in the teenage years because I felt so bad after drinking that it was, it, it rejected itself for me. I'm like, this sucks. Like, I don't want to do this. So, um, okay. Then talking about those specifically what it's doing to people's bodies. Yeah, this is completely normalized. We got people going on the four year party plan at college and they're blacking out two to three times a week. And then wondering why they come out with various diseases or the freshman 15 is now like the freshman 150, right? Like it's crazy what's happening to people. And I'm, I'm not making fun of it or making light of it at all. Like I see friends that have went to college, they come out, they were healthy before they swear they felt good and their health is in shambles now. So um, what are some of the things that like we might uh, see on the lab tests, even with the chronic drinkers or alcoholics, like what's going on there? So I think a lot of, a lot of times we're going to see a lot of cortisol 
you know, issues. Um, on the on that we run the Dutch or I run the Dutch. So I'll see sometimes a lot of like I'll see more spikes all over of their cortisol and it won't be anything that's like really sort of like a flat line or a high line. Um and you can sometimes correlate it with when they're drinking because I'm now working with a lot of women who were drinking or are drinking. It's interesting. That seems to be like what I'm I'm getting these days. But also uh you know your indican so like your gut markers are totally either really, really low, really, really high. So you've obviously done a lot of harm to your gut microbiome, which alcohol does. You will see, I see a lot of estrogen dominance. Mm -hmm. So, you know, alcohol is a major impact on your ability to detox and your drainage pathways, right? So I always like to say when I'm, when I'm talking to someone who's talking about drinking and, and, and their body is, you know, at, at 130 or two, when you wake up, those nights that you've been drinking, that's when your liver is starting to detox your body. So that's when the drainage pathways start because, you know, we all need our sleep. I just did a, a an IG Live with Essentia Organics Mattress, my little plug there, but they talk all about sleep there. But like we wake up then and that's our body saying, what the hell have we done? You know, because your body is always going to choose, like I've read all these studies now, your body is always going to choose alcohol as the first thing to detoxify in the body. So it's not going to go for your hormones and whatever else that your body is like, you know, ingesting, I shouldn't say, but is picking up during the day. So like the soy candles, the you're working in an office that has a lot of toxins and EMF, like your body doesn't even go for that. It goes for the alcohol and it wakes you up because it doesn't know. It's like, what have you done to me? Yeah. Um, and even if it's a glass of wine, so your sleep's disrupted. You see the estrogen dominance because it's your body's not able to flush out a lot of the excess hormones that it needs to is what I see a lot of, um, you know, neurotransmitters or dopamine, your neurotransmitters are haywire for sure. Cause it impacts all that. Yeah. If you're working with, uh, first of all, this is awesome that you're working with people who are, are doing this because you know, you're just so real. And that's been true when I met you three years ago, it's still true now. You're just like, here it is, take it or leave it. And I like that. I think that's just a good way to go through life, especially um, if you've dealt with things like people like us have dealt with, it's better. You, you don't want to live that lie. You don't want that double agent thing that I was talking about before. I'm like, here it is. You like it? Great. If you don't like it, no problem at all. Totally fine. Um, so I feel like it's awesome that you're working with these people because they probably don't feel judged in the slightest. At the same time, we still got to work on this, no doubt. Are you noticing, uh, even labs aside and impact on the body aside, are you noticing any common themes? Like, Are there any people that you work with that really just started drinking recreationally and then all of a sudden it became a problem or was this always there was something deeper uh, that they were trying to hide or self-treat because i feel like the longer i'm in this the more i realize everyone with these problems is self-treating something it, it seems that way to me at least oh yeah I, I think that's the world we live in you know i think we're indulgent when it comes to how we deal with you know emotions for sure i think that if, if it's not alcohol, it's probably sugar is what I'm seeing a lot of. So a lot of my clients, like, honestly, if they don't drink, they're addicted to sugar a hundred percent. And it's a emotional eating, or it's just like, you know, as you know, with food sensitivities, I always explain to people, like you may be eating healthy foods, but if you have a food sensitivity to them and you have like the ism, which is sort of like addiction kind of behavior in your history, that when you eat those foods, it's going to cause an inflammatory response, right? In your brain, which releases the dopamine, the serotonin, all that feel good stuff that you get when you're getting high or you're drinking or you're eating sugar or you're jumping off a plane or whatever it is you're doing, you know, to, to get that kind of like adrenaline and, and, and that feel good effect, those foods can do the same thing. And so when you're eating inflammatory foods that are, you're reactive to, it's going to be the same response. And then you binge. And so removing all that inflammation is super important um, to the body. Because, I mean, I see food addiction seems to be a theme this week. Like, even in, like, meetings that I'm in and, like, clients, it's crazy. I don't know what it is it's going on right now. All of these things, whether it's the drugs or the reckless activities, I'm not saying skydiving per se is reckless, but that that type of a thrill-seeking activity, right, that, that might be risk-taking. Let's say it's a motorcycle with no helmet. All, all those types of things. 
it's all treating that same issue that it, it gives you this feeling. It gives you that aliveness that you might not otherwise feel. Um, it's still something I work on to this day. I mean, I feel great most of the time and I'm thankful for that, but I can catch myself in the, these little habits that don't make sense. Like I actually referenced the the motorcycle thing. Not, I don't have a motorcycle. It's like a glorified scooter, but the way I had so much resistance to riding something like that. I have coached friends out of having one because I realized how stupid it was. And then I went to Italy uh, with my now fiance, Maddie, and there was like those little Vespas and everyone's driving them. So I'm like, all right, whatever, I'll try this. It was, it's just one more thing. And it's like, I got to always be careful with that stuff because I, I feel like some of the audience might not even get what I'm talking about, but I know you do. It's like, you're better off not messing with the temptation of it. Like, just don't start things that you know you're going to love. Cause the second I got on that thing, I'm like, oh, this is bleeping awesome right and then i go buy one the second i get home I'm like this is crazy how did i go from telling friends not to do this to i now have one and i'm whipping around uh, doing something that is that's a, that it's not safe so i still catch myself uh prone to these things nowadays so it's like there's obviously this bigger overarching problem and theme that these people deal with or, or us us people deal with right how do you help them through that these clients right like i mean it's one thing to get off the alcohol but it's another thing to go live a productive life afterwards where you don't feel like crap all the time yeah so there's a lot of times when you when you quit using the alcohol then you got to feel everything right so you know as i i always explain to people that your health is like a wheel you know there's going to be a ton of spokes that you got to deal with and it's not going to be just running labs with me but you're gonna have to look at your family your mental emotional you're gonna have to look at like on my intake form not only do I talk about like just like your health, general health, but I go through like a tr like your trauma, like from when you were born. We talk about like what that lifestyle, what what your home life was like. Was there an alcoholic parent? Was there a verbally abusive parent? Was there, you know, we we go through all of that to find out like are, where where's the stress coming from? Where, what have you been dealing with your whole life? And usually I can pinpoint it back to something from their childhood some sort of trauma or PTSD and like the stories I hear are unreal. And then, you know, that's where I have a toolbox of coaches too, where I can refer out to work on the mental, emotional, like aspect of it, depending on whatever it is they say, like, you know, I am not, I'm, I'm like the, there's a lot of therapy therapist kind of role that comes with being an FBN or we hear a lot of it. But I know where my my line is when someone needs to like go to that next level. But I also strongly encourage it and explain the benefits that it, that will occur when they start to deal with that end of it. Because if you're not dealing with trauma or you're in a relationship that's unhealthy and it's just like eating you alive, that stress alone will make you sick. Mm -hmm. Bottom line, I have a perfect example is like I did all the things and and ran my labs. And this year it was like, okay, I'm, I'm tackling this emotional shit because that's why I relapsed. Um, I wasn't dealing with any of the emotions. Um, and I, and I didn't want to feel like I was going through a divorce. I was getting, my kid was getting taken away from me to my ex. I didn't know what's going on. So like, I just wanted to black out. I didn't care. It was not a social thing. I didn't want to feel a thing. And I, and I, decided 2023 20, i'm not doing this anymore and i am in I, I go to therapy i go to meetings i'm i do service work i do you know i go into prisons and i chair AA meetings because i know i mean i love helping them but it helps me you know and i i do i'm doing all the mental emotional part and it's like I, besides my mouth journey but i i do feel so much better like i'm able to sit in it if i gotta sit and cry then i sit and cry but then but i'm not as sick you know, if I hold it in, that's when my stomach will hurt and that'll increase inflammation. And that, you know, messes with my gut microbiome, which leaves me more, you know, susceptible to getting parasites and a bacteria overgrowth and hormone, dom you know, estrogen dominance is what I see. I mean, I, I love how you worded that because, and then correct me if I'm wrong, because I, I think you would agree with this. I, I complimented you on being vulnerable and very transparent. Now, at the same time, I would say that's not my default. One of the reasons that I do that now is because to me, it's actually more therapeutic than holding it all in. So oh, yeah. would, would you agree with that? It actually feels better, believe it or not, to just, hey, this is the life. This is what happened, what didn't happen. But that feels better than every day's a lie, every second a lie, every conversation. Like that eats you up, man. I oh, it eats you up over a week, let alone... 10 years, whatever it might be for someone, right? Yeah, there's a lot of shame. And there's a lot of shame just saying, I'm an alcoholic mm -hmm. or, yeah. you know, I'm an addict. And I think for a minute there, it, it was always I was an addict. 
Like I knew it's all the same thing, but I was always an addict. I never really said I was an alcoholic. Mm -hmm. And then now I'm definitely, you know, I would say now I'm an alcoholic addict, but like, I am proud to say that because I'm changing, I'm working on my legacy and making sure I leave a positive mark, you know, in using my story to help other people. And I think there was a lot of shame and I was afraid that it would be, you know, it would sound like I am lacking humility and I didn't have the ability to be humble and very egocentric if I shared my story. But now I just, it's like I hit 40 and I'm like, okay, I don't even care. You, I, and I mean this seriously, you, you don't even 1% come across as arrogant. It's, it's literally the exact opposite. So, um, Oh, we appreciate what you're doing with people that might be listening to something like this, because we have a variety of people that listen to this show um, and they're going to click on a title with alcohol in it. I think one of the toughest things, and I don't know how to answer this yet myself is my brain does not work like this. I kind of have to be all or nothing. But what I want to ask is if someone's listening and maybe they are an FDN, maybe they are a health coach and they're actually doing pretty well health wise, but you know, they do get drunk once a month, once every two months. They do, you know, have a glass of wine four or five nights a week. How, I, I just like to hear it from different people. How do you define when something is truly problematic? Because I think you and I are probably the same in the sense that I really, I can't do the whole balanced thing. That doesn't work particularly well for me with, with most stuff. Some stuff it does, but it's either we're all in or we're all out. That's not how most people live. Plenty of people live, uh, the middle of that. So how do you know if you're an FDN or a health coach or whatever, that this is problematic? Well, so I always say, you know, obviously I'm, in, I, I am in the program. I, I like the 12 steps. I think everybody should apply the 12 steps to their life in general. So for me, but I always say like, are you powerless? Are you powerless over the ability to stop or what you're doing? You know what I mean? Like, do you feel like, like whether it's sugar, like, are you powerless over sugar and you literally cannot stop it? You know, there's number one. Is your life becoming unmanageable because of it? Hmm. So are you, you know, is there wreckage in, in your past? Are you lying? Are you, you know what I mean? Are you not following the principles that you feel like you should be living by? Are you, you know, is it impacting other people? But I think the biggest thing is if you're powerless and your life is becoming unmanageable because of it. So, hmm. you know, you wake up every day in that shame cycle because you ate five Snickers that night, or you wake up and you're like, man, I'm going to quit drinking tomorrow. Oh my God. I can't believe I drank. And you just can't stop. It's, it's like you're powerless over it, whether it's a binge or if it's a daily habit. I think that that is the number one thing. Um, and I know people hate the word powerless. They feel like that's, you know, some people get fixated on that. And so it's like, whatever your path is to figure out whether it's a problem or not, but like, these are creating problems in your life. Yes. You know, I mean, for me, honestly my health was creating problems like my stomach aches i didn't want to go out i was i was uncomfortable in my own skin um and this was before this is when i was sober so like this is you can take it back to just being you know root cause wellness it's like i, I didn't want to put clothes on i didn't want to go to any dinners because i was trying to not eat anything that i thought would make i didn't even know how to navigate going out that was like Oh my God, the stress of that alone, you know? And so my life was completely unmanageable and I was like powerless over what I was going to feel like every single day. And that's the drive that kept me going to figure out there is so, I'm not living this way. Like, I'm not going to live this way. Like I'm not going to have my period every other week and have some doctors say I'm normal and I need to go on antidepressants. Like that just doesn't make sense. Like it doesn't make sense. Like I, it doesn't take a rocket science whatever i'm trying to say an astronaut i don't know someone <laughs> astronauts are probably smart yeah right, right, we'll go for that. so it doesn't it doesn't t it's not a lot to figure that out and your gut's telling you like my yeah. gut told me like with my teeth my gut told me this tooth was cracked right i don't even know how i knew i just knew and it turned out that it was completely right at the end that that tooth needed to come out and it was just my gut instinct but i i listened to all these doctors and wasted all this time doing all this other crap but like you have to listen to your body and people don't take the time to pause to do that. You know, if you're drinking too much, you know, if you're eating too much sugar, you know, if there's something going wrong in your gut, if you wake up every single day and you're bloated or you have eczema, psoriasis all over your body and everyone says you're normal and they just give you creams and you're just like something more, it, it, nothing's getting better. Mm -hmm. Like your life isn't getting better. But if you start to make the proactive steps, to better your life, then you'll see all these things start to go away. And you have to fight for your health. I mean, you have to be an advocate. I, 
I love what you said about you know because we can't always trust feelings 100%, right? Because, and the reason I say this is there are pro bodybuilders and also anorexics with body dysmorphia who do feel like they either need to get bigger or get smaller. And of course, those feelings can't be trusted. Talk to However, them, like, talk to them not a the year same. after they quit everything. That's sure, sure. We can work with them. Yes. And that is not the same as a gut feeling though. That is not what we're talking about here because again, most people on this show, when I ask them, how do they get into the functional medicine side? The vast majority of answers are, I just knew it didn't make sense. Something told me that I had to do something else. And that's really what happened to me. I mean, I, I stacked on the seventh diagnosis. I I'm only 18. I mean, how educated could I have possibly been? So it's not like I was the smartest person. I just didn't buy it. I'm like, how can I be so sick when all my other friends for the, for the most part seemed fine at the time. And simultaneously I'm being taught in high school science class that my genes are the best of the best. And that's how I got to hear them. Like this is the best of the best that my family could do. I'm sick as hell. Like it, it didn't add up to me. And I think sometimes it's very appropriate to have those, those intuitions. And most people are scared, um, especially women, not because they're naturally scared, but because they're more gaslit by the medical society, right? They're told, oh, we'll put you on an antidepressant or you're just too stressed or whatever. So there's this very natural fear that comes from speaking out against this and saying, um, this isn't right. But what I love about you is you're a hell of a strong personality. I think uh, many people would listen to you and they want to absorb some of that. So what would be some words of advice to maybe you know, people, but also women out there that they know something's wrong, whether it's too much alcohol or they know something's wrong with what the doctor's telling them and they don't have the courage to take that step yet. What would you maybe tell them? You know, I, I think it's, um, I think number one is defining like what sick is. So I think one thing that like us at the end, we say, oh, sick, 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 sick. And like to us, it makes sense. Right. But I'm learning like the more people I, I talk to and work with is like, they don't look at, they think sick, they think of like sinus infection, diabetes or something like that. But like, you can be un, like not feeling well, not feeling your best, something your body doesn't feel like it's at 110%. I think that's one thing you need to kind of recognize. And I think with women is you've got to learn to be an advocate for yourself. So with that being said, learn how to go to your doctor if you're going to stick with the Western medicine route learn, you know, write things down, make a, uh, make a list, hear that. make a list of what, you know, questions you have, you know, do the research and don't be afraid to treat it sort of as like dating. So like fumble. So, you know what I mean? I'm serious. Yes. It's like, you can yes, I love that analogy. <laughs> sugar, come here. Sorry. My it's dog okay. didn't sugar. <laughs> hey, we made it 40 something minutes in and we're good. So that's, that's all good. It's just a game of the, the zoom and stuff. Um, with that said, I'll, I'll give you a second to figure that out. So with that said, though, you are nice. You are someone that has been doing the FDN thing for a while. Uh, again, you're kind of like an OG FDN. So I'm sure you have amazing client stories from over time. I actually think I remember uh, what you said last time, but I'm always curious because we'll talk about where people can find you right after this. But can I hear some stories about maybe someone that came to you and just they're at the end of the rope and it really was a, a transformational experience for them. It could be someone that's dealing with the alcohol or drug abuse thing. It doesn't have to be though. I just want to know a special story to you. Um, so I had a client come to me where, you know, it's like they literally spoke our language, but they didn't realize they were speaking it where they're just like, I'm just so sick of like, I can't live this way anymore. It's just kind of like that. Like, every, and then, Oh, my labs are normal. Blah, blah, blah. blah. It was like, it was, it was, it was all the things, but they had a mouth full of metal. They had, and nobody, like, it's like the doctors didn't even ask them anything, but a mouthful of metal covered in eczema. I worked with this client for a really, really long time. Um, I mean, GI issues up the wazoo. She was on a Mirena IUD. She had, um, you know, done the vaccine, got a yeast infection every time she did it. One time got a UTI, one time got like period spotting. Like it was like every little thing, her body was just on fire. And we slowly started just like peeling the layers of the onion. And she was one of those where it was like that roller coaster where it's like, I don't feel good. I don't feel good. And I, and we just, she, we do the coaching on like the mental emotional part where she was like, well, why am I not losing weight? And it was always that. And I'd be like, okay, let's go back and look at all the things that have changed. But <laughs> she, um, you know, we did the gut health. She had a parasite. Um, we got rid of that. You know, we did all the things. We we worked on her diet. We adjusted that. She was intermittent fasting and doing all that good stuff. She totally changed the way she ate. 
and taught her how to like sort of relive her life with like normal, more normal behaviors where she could just eat more normal and not try some sort of fad diet. She found out, you know, the estrogen dominant. I mean, this was like cookie cutter, everything, but the eczema was the tough one. And I finally said, like, it's not going to be me. It's you're going to have to go to a biological dentist and you're going to have to get your, your mercury fillings removed. And within one week of getting it removed, it, it all went away. Wow. So wow. Yeah. that's, it's such a, that was like a perfect example though, of what we do as FDNs, because yes, we do these labs. Yes. We do the work. Sometimes we're these, um, these educated guides and we, we help show them something. How many people even know a biological dentist even exists or what that is? Most don't. So even if you're not the one taking the stuff out, the fact that you can guide the person as part of your program, that's huge. That's huge. We're the ones that are doing the research all day and like studying this stuff. And I, I always say to anyone that is considering working with us and I say us cause my fiance is actually the one that works with the lab clients a lot. I always say, if we can't figure this out, Dude, I know someone who can, right? Even AFDNP alone, like we, I have the person, I don't know who it is yet, but we can figure this out. Do you just want to, do you want to play the game? Do you want to participate and really try? And if the person has the will, we can get them through it. So if someone's listening today and just realizing, okay, because I know, I know there's going to be people out there. That's like, this is my woman. Like I get her. I'm like her, uh, because you're a unique person, but I know this subtype of individual. So someone's going to love you to death and want to work with you. Where the heck can they find you? Um, I would say the best route would be um, on social media, I, honestly, is Instagram. It's uh, CFIT Living, so S-E-E-F-I-T and then living. But uh, also my uh, CFIT PT at uh, gmail.com or www.cfitpt.com. Cool. And we'll have that in the show notes for people. Or my name. Yeah, yeah. I probably... Um asked this to you on episode 19, but again, who the heck would remember? I can't remember. So what the signature question is on the show uh, is if we could give you, Sam, a magic wand and you could wave it and you could get every single person in this world to do one thing for their health. So that means you can force us all to start doing one thing for our health, or you can force us all to stop doing one thing. What is the one thing that Sam would get us to do? Uh, I think it's going to be the same thing. I'm not very original. Uh, <laughs> I could add something to it, but eat whole foods. Do you remember that that well? Was that really what you said on episode 19? Probably. I mean, why <laughs> wouldn't it be that? I mean, I well, think you just said, enough. let's start with your nutrition. And then the next would be work on your mental and emotional. Very well. Yeah. Well said, because if it's, and if it's a principle, yeah, why would it change, I suppose, over those few years? Like, the principles stay the same. Lab tests change. Supplements get advanced. That's all cool. But uh, the principles of wellness stay the, uh, stay the same. So Yeah, be you. proactive, not reactive. I don't know. Good, yes, yeah. Thank you so much for coming on again. I'm glad we got to redo this when we have an actual audience uh, for you to get to talk to. So you I'm know, excited. Barely, to... You know, we barely talked about gut health and alcohol. <laughs> yeah, that, that's true. <laughs> like fourth um, podcast where I'm, our thing where I'm supposed to get on and talk about how alcohol impacts the gut and like you're, how much, you're absorbing nutrients. And then it's never on the I mean, we could part to it if you're open. We can. Okay. Yes. You, you and me together, I think we could do part two, part three part four. So um, we might have to bring you back pretty quick then if that's okay. All right. I'm okay. Thank you.